Hi everyone and welcome to Emotional Autoimmunity and I have the pleasure today of speaking to the lovely Eileen Laird of Phoenix Helix and I'll tell you a little bit about Eileen from my notes that I made here earlier on. So Eileen started her website of Phoenix, Phoenix Helix to share everything that she's learned so far about reversing autoimmune diseases. Eileen is the autoimmune columnist for Paleo Magazine. She is the host of the Phoenix Helix podcast and she is author of a really wonderful book that you really all need to get your hands on, which is called A Simple Guide to the Paleo Autoimmune Protocol. Eileen is also a firm believer that everything tastes better if you wear purple when you cook. <laughs> Welcome, Eileen. It's lovely to be talking to you. Thank you. This is really fun. It was such an honor when you asked, so I'm looking forward to it. Brilliant. So we'll start off with the first question. If you could just tell us all, what autoimmune diseases do you have and what was your journey to get to where you are now? Sure. So rheumatoid arthritis is my autoimmune diagnosis and I had my first symptoms a little over four years ago now in the beginning of 2012. And prior to that, I, I felt like I was a pretty healthy person. I ate organically, nothing in the paleo template that wasn't even on my radar. But um, I cooked my, you know, I did homemade home cooking on my meals and I exercised every day. And uh, my most recent trip had been to Moab, Utah, which has some lovely hiking. We hiked 10 miles a day, so I was in really good shape. I worked full-time as a massage therapist, specializing in deep tissue therapy, so I felt strong. But the year prior, I had intermittent, very strong digestive pain, that unknown cause. And I kind of ignored it, <laughs> thinking it will just go away. And it wasn't all the time. It was kind of hard to figure out what was going on. And then when the rheumatoid arthritis symptoms kicked in um, because I had had that just digestive pain a year prior I think that set me up to start thinking of the diet connection that I didn't think that was a coincidence that that had happened beforehand and so when I couldn't deny rheumatoid arthritis anymore and I was looking for solutions beyond medication that's when I found uh, the paleo template so that's kind of a quick summary but should I talk a little bit more about how it feels to develop an autoimmune disease? Because I know that's a big deal that you like to talk about in your listeners and I didn't, that was a very superficial uh, description of the experience. But so what happened is early January, I woke up one morning and it hurt to put on my shoe. There was like a sore spot underneath the pinky toe on one of my feet. And I thought, well, that's weird but didn't really think much about it and went on with my day. And then the next day, the exact same spot on the opposite foot was tender. And I think a rheumatologist right then, that would be a red flag because it's bilateral, identical spots um, in a, and the balls of the feet are a very common place for it to show up. And within a couple of weeks, it was the entire ball of both feet. And I didn't know it was rheumatoid arthritis at that point. I just thought it was odd and it was quite painful. And I took, um, ibuprofen so that I could continue on with my day and I was able to to do everything still but it was confusing to me that that was happening and then slowly over the next couple of months I didn't fit in my shoes anymore and so I had to wear sandals even though it was in the winter time and clearly things were going on and if I was the type of person who went to the doctor which I'm not I, I probably would have been diagnosed sooner but then finally it went to my hands and the similar things started happening in my hands so um, I'd wake up one morning and not be able to bend one or two fingers and then the next morning it would be a different set of fingers and then it went to my wrists and then it started ricocheting around my body in a way that I would call um, Russian roulette flare style. So I would wake up in the morning with sore hands and feet and feeling about 90 years old, very stiff. It hurt to move, kind of like a cross between the Tin Man and a very inflamed tin man, right? A tin man on fire <laughs> is kind of what it felt like. And But that was the good part of my day, frankly. By evening, I would get the flare, and what a flare meant for me was that one of my joints, the pain would become so extreme it needed to be immobilized, or I would be gasping and crying because it was so painful. So if it was my wrist, 
it would have to go into a brace. If it was my shoulder, it would go into a sling. If it was my knee, I couldn't stand. I had to get off my feet. Um, if it was my jaw, I couldn't open my mouth, which was the most terrifying one for me. I think that's very primal. You know that if you can't open your mouth, you can't eat, you can't survive. So I was crying every day and I was overwhelmed and I knew what it was and didn't want to face what it was. So that was, that was my rock bottom for sure. And that's why I think I was willing to do something like the paleo autoimmune protocol, because I will say, I don't think I would ever have done that preventatively, but it seemed very reasonable compared to what I was experiencing. So. Mm, for sure. And I know, I mean, I can see after 14 months of being on the protocol, how different I feel. So, a lot of people say that their autoimmune diseases have been brewing for a, a long time. And, you know, we just adapt, we adjust, and it's our normal. So if you look back over your life now, did getting that diagnosis give you new insights into things that you might have struggled with growing up or, you know, any other issues that you had, that it's only now looking back from this place of better wellness that you can look back and say, gee, even then I wasn't 100%. Yeah, well, I was always someone who had what I would call sensitive joints, meaning if I did yoga and I tried to lie on a carpet without a mat underneath me, my hips would hurt. Um, and I liked a nice soft pillow topper on my bed and a firm mattress would wake me up because my joints would get sore. So I had, my husband would jokingly call me the princess in the pea, like the fairy tale that I could tell probably if a pea was under the mattress. It's nothing like the experience of rheumatoid arthritis, I would say, once it was fully manifested, but it seemed to be a hint that throughout my life, I knew that that was an issue for me. And it wasn't unusual, like if I tried to do aerobic exercise, my knees wouldn't like that very much. Um, and then six years prior to the rheumatoid hitting, I had a swollen knee for no reason that the doctors could not figure out, but there was no pain with it. So it was a different very different experience, but I think somehow connected probably my first RA symptom. And interestingly enough for me, um, they would drain my knee. It was fluid that would build up and they would drain. I couldn't stand because it would destabilize the knee and they would drain my knee within 48 hours. It'd be back to the same big size. And because I was a massage therapist, I had actually synchronistically been signed up for a lymph drainage therapy class right after this started happening. I learned how to basically drain myself and I did that on myself every night to, to keep the swelling managed and within six months it, it, it had gone away to the point that it was not disabling anymore but it took three years before I got full range of motion in that knee. So that's an example of a strange weird thing that isn't what your body is supposed to be doing. Doctors didn't have really any answer for me. Um, and looking back, I'm thinking that was probably one of the first times RA tried to kick in maybe. And maybe because the lymphatic work, it's so cleansing and detoxifying and helps your circulation, it helped my digestion, it helped balance my hormones, all these things that affect autoimmune symptoms. Maybe I delayed onset for a few years because of that. So I feel lucky for that. But I will say when it really hit like a wrecking ball in 2012, the lymphatic work couldn't touch it. So it, it definitely came on fast and furious when it finally wanted to come on. Mm. And we tend to think of rheumatoid arthritis as an old people's disease, don't we? I mean, you're, you know, mm. certainly nowhere near that. I mean, what was it like at your age to have a diagnosis of something like that? Well, I don't think of it as an old people's disease because it's nothing like arthritis. So mm. my mother, for example, ironically, has osteoarthritis, which the only thing we have in common is joint changes, but there's nothing else about her experience and my experience that are the same. So that's a result of her age. She's in her upper 80s. She didn't have any arthritis until I think maybe her 60s or 70s even. Um, she never had the kind of pain I had ever to that level. And how she described it was that it would feel like pressure on her joint rather than fire inside the joint. For me, it was like it was on fire. For her, it would be pressure, 
for a couple of days as the joint changed shape and then it would never hurt her again. So it was a very different experience and probably because I knew my mother's experience and then I had younger clients with autoimmune disease. I kind of think of autoimmune disease as a younger people's issue, even though you then have it for the rest of your life. People can get it and even, and RA, the juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is one of the toughest versions of it. So often if someone gets it as a child, it's one of the hardest ones to control. So, so it didn't make me feel like something weird was happening age-wise, but it does make you feel old overnight because your body is so stiff, sore, and weak, which isn't the young experience, right? Mm. Especially to go from, you know, actively hiking and being fit to, you know, being yeah. immobile or not wanting to move just because of the pain. That must have been really hard. It was really hard. And I think the fear is you'll never get your abilities back. I mean, within six months, I was essentially disabled. So I couldn't walk across my living room without limping. I couldn't wash dishes because I couldn't, I couldn't, my wrists weren't strong enough to lift the dish. I had trouble washing my hair because I couldn't raise my arms over my head. Um, it's, it's a powerless feeling. And I know it's so different depending on the autoimmune disease or chronic illness, but there's so many different ways you can just kind of, you feel like you've just gotten taken out. Like mm. your life is just suddenly nothing like your life used to be. Mm. And I think it's natural for all of us want to just do anything we can to get our life back. I think that's part of the motivation for doing everything we can to get healthier. And I know part of my journey has been accepting that I'm not going to get my life back. And by now it's been for over four years, so I know that. But I'd say the first year was just wanting to just fix it, just totally fix it, not have it anymore. Be the one who beat this thing, could train the world how to do it. You know, I'm sure that's such a common fantasy. And there was a lot of emotions like later in my journey at the two year mark and at the three year mark in real in really having to accept that even though I got significantly better was no longer living with excruciating pain I didn't have the strength or ability I had before this became part of part of who I am and for me to be able to say that to you now without crying is a big deal mm -hmm. that um and I can because I I've really been working on that because I think what can I say about that like there's a community of people who believe that you're not supposed to accept your diagnosis, that somehow therefore you manifest your diagnosis. And I have found that for me personally, acceptance is a huge piece of healing. So to stop denying my experience, denying who I am, being at odds with what is, and it's not a fatalistic thing. It's not where I visualize myself in a wheelchair or or anything like that. It's just like, okay, can I love myself as I am right now? And can I accept that rheumatoid arthritis is a thread that's woven through every cell in my body now? It's not all that I am, but I'm kidding myself if I think it's not part of who I am. So, and yeah. That's, that is such an important point, Eileen, because, you know, I, I really see in all the different communities that there is that divide between, you know, the people who say, I'm going to beat this, this isn't going to be in my life. Then mm -hmm. there's the other people who become so defined by the disease, like it overwhelms them mm -hmm. and they get stuck in the, the mire of the emotional, the, the brain fog and all of that. So it just becomes too much and too big. But in my view, I guess the way for me to cope, because I had a similar experience to you as being disabled, not through the same process, but I didn't have any energy mm -hmm. to do anything. I had no gas in the tank to do anything. I was in a lot of physical pain. Um, and it's when you see your life was one way and then suddenly like everything's off the table and you don't know what's going to happen to you, you have to come to some terms of, acceptance of that so I always think of it as respecting the disease mm -hmm. but at the same time doing everything you can to support yourself physically emotionally medically all of those different sorts of things so you create the best possible health available to you in any given moments yes and so I think you and I are I 
identical in our philosophies on that. Yeah, it is about living the best life possible with autoimmune disease. And for me, part of living the best life possible is accepting that I have it. Because I will say that fighting it all the time is exhausting. And not accepting it, it felt, it, there was a self-love piece that was missing. It was like I'm not somehow worthy if I wasn't strong enough to, to cure it or if I wasn't if I wasn't the miracle worker well you know obviously I'm just this average Joe just like everyone else on the planet right mm -hmm. and it's not that I would ever have thought I thought differently but I think some of those unconscious beliefs are somehow I should have been able to to do something that quite frankly isn't possible to do so so I think accepting it for me is really accepting being human mm -hmm. and being imperfect and finding richness in life that isn't a perfect life and that's the human experience too and i understood it logically when this first happened because i will say i had a really good life up till then and i still have a good life but i'd say that was the hardest thing i'd ever gone through was the onset the rapid and severe onset of rheumatoid arthritis when i didn't know if i could survive what i was experiencing and I had certainly seen enough people in my life who I loved go through similar experiences that knock them to their core. And it may have been, it may have been losing someone extremely close to them that, that they loved. It might have been cancer. It might have been chronic disease, all sorts of different things. And I had somehow sidestepped all of the really tragic things in life for the first 43 years. Now, it doesn't mean life was perfect. I didn't have pain. I did, but not to a soul-crushing level and so i knew even when it happened i could say to myself well this is part of the human experience this is my turn but i still was hoping it was temporary and i could just kind of get over it so yeah so i feel like i've come along this is on my mind a lot because i feel like i've come a long way this year and it's layers right layers of acceptance mm -hmm. and so and and i feel a lot more at peace with myself and a lot more loving toward myself to not be I don't hate the RA in me anymore, I guess. It's not anything I would have chosen, but I gotta, but it's part of who I am. And yeah. certainly good things have come out of it too, as we know that happens. Mm. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the biggest hurdles that anybody faces when they suddenly develop a chronic autoimmune disease or any sort of chronic disease. When they're looking for an answer, people will try something like they might try to change their diet or they may try something else and if it doesn't get them back to exactly where they were before they got sick they give up and say that's not working so they keep searching almost like for the holy grail that's going to get them, their life back to how it was and so that acceptance process and the grief process that you've got to go through is just such an important stage so i'm really glad that you brought that up yeah, and I think you're right. There's definitely a personality who's looking for the magic pill. So they don't really give anything a chance to work. And then there are those of us who will do the things longer, but we feel like we have failed somehow if we haven't reached like remission, for example. So one thing that a lot, I'm, I've, I'm open about this on my blog and podcast, but not everyone hears it. So I will say it again. I am not in remission. So I, I improved my symptoms by about 90, 95%, which was huge. It was the difference between disabling, excruciating pain to living a full and beautiful life. But RA is still active in my body. I am not the person I was before. I need to continue to manage my lifestyle and my diet and my self-care in a way that someone who is healthier than I am doesn't have to do. Um, it requires a lot of vigilance. I'm extremely sensitive. So, um, so there's so those there's all those pieces, and I certainly have uh, searched for like the missing piece to get me to remission, and not found it. And it doesn't mean I won't keep trying kind of different things, functional medicine, but I try it differently now. Like a big part of me is aware of the fact that maybe that's not in the cards for me. It might not be that I, it's it's not necessarily that I haven't found the fix. It might be that there isn't a fix to get me to that level. This might be what I've been able to achieve, which is pretty fabulous. 
because I know people with rheumatoid arthritis and on the strongest drugs you know, available who are in much worse shape than me. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there's an easy answer for this, for this disease. So yeah, so, uh, so part of me, how can I put it? So it's, it's like finding that it's, it's not a desperate way to look or a frantic way to look for another solution. It's just like, well, I'm going to hopefully live a lot longer and I can keep on trying little things here and there and see if that makes me feel better. But I can pace myself and it doesn't have to be my whole life that search. And I don't have to beat myself up if I'm not perfect. I feel like I'm babbling sometimes, so feel free to cut me off. No, no, <laughs> that's, that's all fabulous. And, you know, one of the challenges with living with chronic disease is, you know, we could look healthy, you know, like I look healthier than I've ever looked in my life. And so people mm -hmm. would look at me and say, what do you mean you've got a chronic disease? What do you mean there's certain days you can't do things? And I know there's been lots of changes for me, like things that I do now that I never would have done or had to do in my life prior to becoming chronically ill. So having your invisible illness, which you can't really tell looking at you mm -hmm. on the screen now, can bring up all sorts of emotional challenges. So Eileen, what do you deal with now that you didn't deal with before and how have you had to adapt your life? In terms of how other people see me, you mean? Um, I'm... It re, re, like, because when you mentioned invisible illness, I'm trying to think, like, do you mean how much, how have I had to change my life for rheumatoid arthritis is one part of that question. And yeah. is the other question, do yeah. I feel I need to explain things to people in my life? Yeah. I think is it's that, that part that, that what I mean by the invisible illness is that you look healthy. Mm -hmm. And so people may have certain expectations that you can do certain things like, you know, certain activities and things like that. And so okay, yes. you have to say, actually, no, I can't do that. And they're a little bit uh, taken aback because they go, well, why? You look okay. Yes. I'm very good at setting boundaries and communicating with people in terms of what I can and cannot do for them. But that doesn't mean people haven't tried to talk me out of it. And what's interesting, so like I said, I was a massage therapist. And I started off deep tissue being a big part of my practice, but prior to getting rheumatoid arthritis, as I had said before, I learned that lymphatic work. It was so beautiful. I used it, used it, blending it with massage with almost all of my clients. So they were all used to that technique. And when I got rheumatoid arthritis, I told them I could no longer do the deep tissue, but I could continue to do the lymphatic work. And I offered them the option of staying with me and doing that, or if they wanted the massage, I would refer them to my colleagues because there are a lot of qualified people. And I'd say about three quarters of my clients stayed with me because they found that the lymphatic work was just as relaxing for them. And I think my therapeutic presence was part of what they wanted. So that is an example of a change. And I needed to express what I needed. And they needed to respect that or frankly not be my clients anymore. And Almost all of them did, but a few of them would ask me every few months, which is okay. It didn't feel disrespectful. They would just say, are you getting stronger? Do you think you'll come back to massage? And in the beginning, I thought maybe I would. And then I realized, no, like, cause I, even as I got stronger, when you still have inflammation in your joints, even at a low grade level, putting pressure on them is not comfortable. So I just don't have the flexibility I used to have. And it didn't feel like it would be a healthy thing to do to continue to strain joints that are already strained from within, even if they're only slightly strained from within. So I'd say every one of my clients respected that but one. And she came to see me twice a month. And every time she came to see me, she would ask me to do something I could not physically do. And I would tell her again that I could not physically do it. And it got so frustrating that I dropped her as a client because I felt like she wasn't respecting me. She didn't care about my health if she was continuing to ask me to do something that I blatantly told her would hurt me to do. And, and I didn't like continuing to repeat myself. So that's an example for me, like boundaries, like I will cut someone out of my life if they're not good for me. <laughs> so, so away she went. Um, my friends are they love me so much and I have really good friends but some of that it's just they wouldn't know like um when I was at my worst I was so in so much pain at hugging hurt and the worst thing in the world was being introduced to someone because they'd want to shake your hand mm 
and that just hurt like anything. And so I had to let all my friends know in advance that that wasn't on the table. And thankfully, I can hug people now and shake their hand, and that's not an issue. But there was a time, and I remember I went on a river float with a few friends of mine, and we were blowing up, um, you know, like inflatable mattresses to float down the river. And there's that little whatever you call it, that part you blow on that you pull out and then you put the thing on and you put it in. And I couldn't do that. And I think, again, it's it's one of those things that if you don't have that kind of pain, whatever that pain is, no one can predict that for you. So I didn't feel bad that they didn't understand that because it's crazy. Like when I, when I think of that, when, even when it was happening, I was like, how can I not pull this tiny, how can I not have the strength to pull that tiny thing out and push it in without hurting myself? But I didn't. So I had to I just had to take care of myself enough to be honest and ask for help. So I had to ask for help a lot more often. Um, I am married to a good man. And so he's he was very supportive from the beginning. And I had to ask for his help a lot more than I had prior. That was interesting because he's one of those people who always puts on a good face. And so... When I was at my worst, I could tell it was tearing him apart, but he almost didn't seem to be aware of it because he was so focused on me. And part of what happened, the gift of me improving was seeing him improve emotionally and physically um, alongside me. And it, I will say it's hard for me to talk with him honestly about the journey, I think because he's so wrapped up in it. I think that's just part of the spouse thing we've had a few times when he has downplayed my experience because for two reasons. One is I think it's too hard for him to see when something's difficult for me. So he does, and it's unconscious. He's a nice man, so he wouldn't try to protect himself and hurt me. But by downplaying it, he doesn't have to worry so much. Yes. Yeah. And the other piece was he's big on positive thinking. And so like, he was afraid if I was honest with myself and him about what I was experiencing, somehow that would make it worse. And and then I think part of it is it's a, a gender stereotype, but men do like to try and fix things. They can't fix this. So again, it's hard for them to just listen. So I know um, there were times when I had to, when I burst into tears just because I felt like I wasn't listened to. And I had to have that conversation I think a lot of partners have had where you just say, I don't need you to fix anything. I don't, I, but I need you to just listen and nothing else. Just listen, um, honor that I, I'm, I know myself well enough that I'm not exaggerating this experience and maybe give me a hug and, and that's it. And that feels so much better than someone saying, um, you know, you're, it's not as bad as all that or, <laughs> or whatever. It, yeah. That's that whole validation experience, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, I had a similar issue when I was at my worst with my eldest son, who's um, 26. Mm -hmm. And I could see that he was scared. Mm -hmm. You know, I could see my family was scared for me. They didn't know what was going to happen. I was scared. I was, you know, in such a terrible, terrified state when you feel so powerless and it's so sudden. I was in trauma, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and so his response to that was, you'll be all right, mum. You'll be all right, mum. But I didn't want to hear that. I wanted someone to actually validate and say to me, you're really sick. You know, mm -hmm. you're really, really sick. And, you know, I, I'm scared for you. And that conversely would have made me feel so much better then somebody just keeps saying, you'll be okay, you'll be okay, because I felt far from okay <laughs> and there was no guarantees I was ever going to be okay. So I, I totally get where you're coming from with that and I think that's something that people really need to know. To understand somebody in a crisis, you've actually got to acknowledge what they're saying, that, yes, yeah, I hear you, you're scared, you're in pain, you're, you, you're afraid. Yeah, and if anyone's watching this who loves someone who is chronically ill and they're not chronically ill themselves, what, what I think Carrie and I would say to you is relieve yourself of any pressure to fix anything because we're not looking to you for that. At least, I, I mean, I certainly wasn't. There might be the occasional person who's 
maybe got a victim personality, maybe they think you should fix it, but that's really, I don't, I don't think the vast majority of people are expecting that. And, and then, yeah. And so I think that would be a relief to just say, Hey, you know, we're not expecting anything from you except to love us and listen. And it is such a powerful thing. Like when my husband finally did that for me, I, um, I felt like cathartic. It just felt amazing. I felt ironically, he had been trying to cheer me up, which I didn't realize. <laughs> Um, but when he stopped trying to cheer me up and just listen to me, then the grief kind of lifted, I think, because it just needed to be expressed. So, um, and on a smaller level that happens with people who aren't as close to me, um, I've had people say to me, um, like when I say I'm not as flexible as I used to be, they'll say, well, you're not working out the way you used to be. So, so maybe you're just out of shape. And I, um, they don't mean any harm when they say that. And what they mean by that is when they don't work out and then they try and work out, they feel stiffer and that they're trying to probably relate to my experience. And I'm just like, yeah, it's nothing like that. <laughs> and, and I think to be fair, until they feel what I feel, they, they wouldn't get that. I wouldn't get it either. I think they're trying for that common ground and without realizing it, I think this happens to a lot of people with chronic illness and it's frustrating, is we feel like people are minimizing our experience by comparing it to their own and probably to be fair to the other people they're just trying to understand but they don't have the frame of reference no no yeah. until until it happens to you you have no concept of what it's like and i mean certainly i i know people in my life that have chronic illness and things like that and i had all the empathy in the world but until it happened to me it was like i had a whole new understanding it was personal you know, it was, I felt the exact same, yeah. Carrie, because my massage clients, I, I ironically specialized with people with autoimmune disease because lymphatic work is very helpful for them. But I also found them the most challenging clients because I couldn't make them feel better for long. Each, mm -hmm. each session helped them for a short time and it was so challenging their lives. And I had sympathy and I thought I understood. But yeah, how I would describe it is I had a 2D black and white image of what they were going through and it became 3D full color when I when I got rheumatoid arthritis. And and I don't think there would have been any other way for me to get that kind of empathy. No, no. And I often say to make sense of the experience for me that it, it's it was like getting my autoimmune diseases and, and the way that it happened was like you go into a different world that you never knew was there. So you had entry to this whole new world with a whole population of people that you never really knew about and you become part of that world. And it's, it's a really interesting transition to go through. It is. And one thing I want to speak to with that, because I was thinking when we were talking about the people who loved us the most, sometimes having the toughest time. So, so it's, a, it's important to find someone in your life who you can be honest with, who can handle that. And sometimes it's like people like you and I who will meet each other online. And that's, I think, one of the reasons the Paleo AIP community, it's, it's a beautiful community, I think. It's incredibly supportive and rich and um, deep. And it's just because life is not about the small stuff for us. Like I know I've been in some groups, um, how can I put it? I'm in, I'll sometimes be in conversation with AIP bloggers and the conversation's always so compassion-based for ourselves and our readers. And we really seem to be grounded in what matters and what we're trying to deliver to the people who come to our blogs. And I've tried to network with some bloggers who did not have autoimmune disease and sometimes the things they complained about or worried about I was just I would just always be like are you kidding me like I mean it's just it didn't seem to matter so I think it, it what it does is it it does immediately ground you in what's important and then you find people who understand that too and the one thing I love about the AIP community is we are all empowered to try and help ourselves because I'm sure you've run into this if I join a rheumatoid arthritis group a general one it can be one of the online it can be one of the scariest places to hang out because people are sharing horrifying experiences and often don't feel they have any power to change those experiences and get upset if you suggest they might have some power about it and it could be a really demoralizing place so to find Ooh. the right people who have your experience but also have the right attitude is so important 
Absolutely, and that, that's been my experience, particularly when I first started researching my condition. You know, the, the internet is like a black hole that you can get sucked into, especially when you're vulnerable. And in the groups there are people, and there are people who will get one set idea that you have to do it that way, and if you don't do it that way, then they don't want you in the group, basically. Um, mm. And so people can get very black and white and you've got people in a lot of fear and a lot of despair and, you know, it, it's, it really is, can be a really difficult place. And so I don't go into the support groups now as much as I did. I do sometimes go in and just give an update about how I'm doing and post a few pictures and things like that. Um, and they're a fantastic place, I think, for people to start but you've got to, as you go on, whatever your journey is, it's really helpful, as you say, to find people who are on the same journey as you, in the same place with the same sort of attitude. And that's a great thing about the internet because it gives you access to all these different perspectives and groups and communities. Yes, and I think people who come into your website are just going to find, well, it, the opposite of fear. You know, I think they'll find hope here, which is a wonderful thing. Well, thanks, Eileen. That's what I was looking for and that's what I want to, you know, help people find by talking to people like you. And living with an autoimmune disease, whether you're diagnosed or not, I know for me meant a lot of interaction with doctors, which I'd never really had in my life because I was one of those people who never got sick. So what do you need to deal with, I guess, what was your biggest issue when dealing with the doctors and looking back now with the experience you have, what do you think you might have done differently when dealing with the medical profession? Well, I'll be honest with you that it's pretty new that I'm dealing with doctors. Um, like you, I never went to the doctor before. I even stopped regular checkups because um, I think by the time I hit 30, I felt like they, they were fear-based appointments. They were wanting to test me for everything under the sun. They were already talking prescriptions, even though I was in good health. It seemed kind of crazy. So um, so I kind of opted out of traditional medical care until rheumatoid arthritis hit. And then even then, I didn't want what they had to offer. So I, I just stayed out of it. And then more recently, so it's been four years. And I, like I said, I'm, I'm accepting that this isn't temporary. Um, so I thought it's a good idea to have a relationship with a rheumatologist. They have knowledge as well. Um, they they will track certain things for me that I can't track, ex, you know, on my own. And maybe their input would be helpful. So it's relatively new that I'm going to a rheumatologist, and it's it's not been easy. Um, part of it, again, there's emotions to it, uh, and I hate going. I hate going. I absolutely hate going. And I would say that the rheumatologist I have right now, I don't know if I'm going to stay with her. She's not as bad as some, but she's not near as good as I had hoped. But on the other hand, it's just really hard to find one who understands me at all. Um, I, it was funny when I sent in a little history ahead of time, letting her know how long I'd had symptoms and how they progressed and then how they, how they reversed and what I did to do that and where, where my symptoms still remain and what I was looking for. And so I tried to summarize it in a, it was like a one page bulleted chart because I know they're busy so that she could just have my history before she walked in. And when she walked in, she didn't even make eye contact at first and her whole body language was dreading. You could just tell she was like, oh, she's one of those, like a patient she just totally didn't want to deal with. And um, I tried to be very respectful. I had interviewed Andrea Nakayama on my podcast, who's an expert in Hashimoto's actually, but she was talking about advocacy at the doctor. And, and what she said, which I thought was very helpful, is she said, it's easy to go into the doctor with a chip on your shoulder. And if you're mad, they're going to get defensive. And remember that you're, you, you're choosing to be there and they have something to offer. And if you want them to listen to you and respect you, you need to listen to them and respect them. So I, I went in very submissive very um, soft-spoken, you know, and, and all of that. And we had to go through some things where, you know, her establishing herself as the doctor and that, you know, she didn't seem to think I understood. It was really funny. She said, um, well, if you've never been diagnosed by a rheumatologist, you don't have RA until I say you do. <laughs> and then, and so then, and so then she, um, even though doctors, my general doctor had, could tell 
that what I had and and back four years ago. But anyway, um, and I am a textbook example, by the way. I know some people with autoimmune disease have strange symptoms that are hard to diagnose, but you could put a picture of me next to the definition and diagnostic criteria. It was so ridiculously on point. But anyway, yeah, so when she did examine me, when she was all done, I was like, well, she's like, yeah, you have severe rheumatoid arthritis. <laughs> it was, she just validated everything I said. It's exactly, you know, the joints that are affected or the ones you thought were affected and where you're experiencing inflammation, you know, is where I would say you have inflammation. And um, so it was really funny. So she agreed with everything I said, but she had to act like it was coming from her instead of me. Um, but then, and then she made her recommendations and she knew I wasn't going to take them all, and, but she didn't yell at me or pull out the wheelchair card or anything. So it could have been worse, but it was odd. It, it, I think it just feels like you're trying to have a relationship with someone where you're with a different religion, maybe almost or something, because you're just looking at things so differently. And so you want that to be amicable and, and beneficial to both of you, but it's, it's certainly difficult. And so we'll see there. I might try and go to continue with her. I might go with, with someone else. So that's, so that's just been weird. And then the insurance in the United States is awful. And when I say that, I mean, there's, it's crazy. Cause um, when I started going to the doctor, I, I went ahead and got insurance. You have to pay for it yourself here. It's quite expensive. So I, it's weird, like, um, I don't know how to, just, every single thing I've had to go to that costs money, I've had to fight my new insurance company to get them to pay for it. So that's been interesting and eye-opening, and I've heard of that before, but I just thought, I'm doing pretty well, right? Like, I'm not at rock bottom with rheumatoid arthritis anymore, so I have energy and I'm not in crisis, Thank, thankfully. Mm. And if I was, my stress resilience would be almost non-existent and to on top of that be continually have obstacles put between you and medical care it's it's horrifying and so it's it's even i get upset with what i have to do right now obstacle wise and i'm feeling pretty great so i just think goodness for someone who is in crisis or in fearing for their life some people's symptoms are so bad and they're calling from the hospital bed trying to get their insurance company to, you know, pay for whatever services they need. So, so that's its own thing in our country that I think anyone with autoimmune disease, I'm sure fights with that all the time. And so it's brand new for me compared to other people. I have very little to complain about, but I don't, I don't like it. I feel like it should be more seamless than that. Mm. No, that sounds horrific. Mm -hmm. Really, really horrific. So, Autoimmune disease adds so many challenges to how we feel and perceive and relate to our body. And I find that when a lot of people talk about their autoimmune disease and what's happening with them, they have this attitude or belief that their bodies have betrayed them. So, mm. Eileen, did having your rheumatoid arthritis, does it change the way you see your body and did it change your relationship with it? Yes, but in a different kind of way. I'll say that I was never... How can I put it? One of the first posts I wrote on my blog was my body is not my enemy. So right from the beginning, I've always believed in healing through love. And I think I came to that philosophy long before I got rheumatoid arthritis. And I tried to help my clients with that too. Some of my clients would come in and say, beat my body into submission. And I would say, honey, that's not what your body needs. And so we're not going to do that today. But I will, um, you know, I will provide tender, loving care to your body and, and you will hopefully feel much better when you leave. So, so I had that philosophy anyway. And when it happened to me, I felt very tender towards my body and I definitely wanted to care for my body. And then I think what I realized very recently is I felt like I had been the one who had betrayed my body rather than the other way around. And that was an unfair position for me to take as well. So I blamed myself for getting autoimmune disease because I wasn't perfect beforehand, because I had had some symptoms that were clearly problematic with the digestion and I didn't do anything about it, that when rheumatoid arthritis started to develop, I waited until it was at a peak crisis before doing anything about it. And part of me, I think, believed that if I had done something sooner, I could have stopped it from happening. And looking back now, like if anyone else had told me that, I would be like, oh, Carrie, no, you know, no, that's not how it works. We're not that 
powerful, actually. I mean, we we are like we can. I will always say it's about living the best life possible with autoimmune disease, and our choices make a huge difference in how we feel. But it, we're, it's not the same as being able to fix it completely, or even prevent it completely. So when I look back on my life, first of all, it's funny. Like when I look back on my life, I it's like okay, I ate organically, I gave up a high stress job and started working. I only part time as a massage therapist because I didn't want to have too much stress in my life. Um, I was excellent on self-care, doing things like lymph drainage therapy on myself on a regular basis. I got fresh air. I loved my job, so I didn't have any problem with that. I had a good marriage. Um, I had ended some toxic friendships and made good friendships, so I learned there. I'd resolved issues from my childhood. Like if you had a checklist of like things to do that to remove potential inflammation triggers or disease triggers, I had kind of gone through that list, not perfectly. Like I, I never smoked, I never did drugs. I stopped drinking to get drunk when I was 20, even before I was legal. Um, I ate junk food, not to excess, I was never obese. I drank Diet Coke, so I had you know things that I wasn't perfect, but um, when I look back on my life, it's so ridiculous to pick things like, okay, so I drank Diet Coke and I let some digestive symptoms go unresolved, so therefore I deserved to have autoimmune disease. I deserved rheumatoid arthritis. So, so that was interesting to uncover and forgive myself for. And part of it was the logic part helped in terms of just looking at it more clearly. And then it was almost surprising to know I even thought that way. And then I know what it was on a deeper level is I think if I blamed myself for getting it, that meant I caused it, which means I could cure it. And instead, if I can, if I have to accept that maybe this was going to happen to me no matter what, and I'm going to continue to have this no matter what, that is an again a new level of acceptance. And um, so anyway, I don't know if that's clear or not. So that's how I feel now. I feel like I used to feel like I betrayed myself. I no longer feel like I betrayed myself. I forgive myself for not being perfect. And I'm just trying to keep on loving my body going forward and loving myself going forward. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's such an incredibly common thing. And I see that all the time with my clients, those who have autoimmune diseases and those who don't. You know, it's like you get to a point where you have this like epiphany or this insight or this realisation. You can look back and go, ah, I sort of see where that might have come from or I sort of see the path that led me to where I am now and then what happens is people get so angry with that former self mm -hmm. or angry with that part of their life but I always say to them that that is so unfair that is so unfair to you because you've just got this insight you've just got to this place where you've got this knowledge and clearly this this was the point, the only point you're ever going to get that knowledge. So it's not fair to judge who you were then by who you are now. I mean, that's like blaming your two-year-old self for something that's happening to you in your 50s. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, have the insight go fantastic. I have the insight. I can see, you know, what could have contributed. What can I do now that's going to make that better? And from that place you get into power. Yeah, I love how you put that. And that's, it is true. I mean, you're, you don't know what you know till you know it. And I, I'll tell you, when I look back, when I was having that digestive pain, the most I would have considered doing was going gluten-free. Paleo was not in my radar. So I really don't. And when I did go gluten-free prior to paleo, it did nothing for me. So, <laughs> so it's funny. So even when I see these points where I could have addressed it, I don't know that I, like you said, I wouldn't have had the knowledge to address it correctly anyway. So, all yeah, the it is what it is. I'm sorry, what? I said all the motivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the motivation, absolutely. And and for me, the you know, a lot of people um, sort of said, oh, how could you change your diet so radically? And I was like, I was so sick. I was willing to do whatever it took so that I could stay alive. <laughs> yeah, that, and that I feel the it. exact same way. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I remember when I first started trying diet, I tried gluten-free, sugar-free first, think, and I remember hoping that I could get the sugar back. <laughs> it's just so funny when I look at it now. And then when I mentioned that Diet Coke business, um, I remember I had a friend 
and we had been trying to give up Diet Coke for years, and we were just hooked on it, you know. And and after I had been paleo for six months, she asked me, "Are you drinking Diet Coke?" And I just laughed, and it would seem it made me laugh to even think that was ever hard for me to give up because mm. I don't even think about it now, and I I would never consider drinking it now, and I think, golly, that was the easiest of everything I've given up. But but at the before this happened to me, it was quite hard. So you're right if you don't have the motivation. Yeah. And I think that's that's where a lot of people struggle with making big lifestyle changes because they're not sick enough mm -hmm. to that point where they're desperate that they'll try anything. They're managing, they're coping, you know, they may not be feeling really good, but it's sort of, it seems like normal life. And so for people from that perspective, it, it's it's harder, you know, it can seem so overwhelming to say, I, I can't eat bread anymore, I can't eat cereal anymore, I can't eat this anymore. So you become too focused on what you're going to give up mm. because there's no concept you're actually going to gain anything. But when you're at the bottom, there's nowhere else to go but down. So it's like I will do anything to change. I think you're right and it's a different point for each person. So. <clears throat> Whitney is a, w a woman, she has a Facebook page called Nutrisclerosis and she has multiple sclerosis and she told me, she remembered saying something like she would rather um, be in a wheelchair than give up bread. And um, she said she's mortified when she remembers she said that, but the truth is it took until she had trouble walking. She was going shopping for a walker. Then she, did, then she went paleo, but up till then, all the symptoms she was having, which were uncomfortable and a little frightening, and they involved her vision and various other things and muscle weakness, but she could still get by. It wasn't until she was like, my husband needs to help me get out of the car and I might need a walker to go down the street that I am ready to do that. So yeah, we all have that point. Mm -hmm. And some people, that point comes sooner than others. But I think for a lot of us, like you said, it's, it's a rock bottom place where suddenly it doesn't seem that hard to do the AIP. No. Mm -hmm. no, and it just becomes a way of life. So yes. stress can play a huge part in how we feel. And you said that you've, you'd already made some changes, you were going part-time work and things like that. But do you have any tips on stress relief that you'd be able to pass on to the people watching? Yeah, well, it's funny. I'll always bring up meditation and for people who are feeling that they can't do that are probably rolling their eyes and say, no, don't say that again. But I'm going to speak to it because it's helped me a number of different times. So when I was at my worst, meditation was the one thing that could calm me down emotionally. So I will say I'm not one of those people who it has a miraculous immediate effect on my symptoms, my physical symptoms. But it relieves so much of the emotional pain that comes surrounding those symptoms and that emotional pain can make the symptoms worse. So I think, so when I was flaring, for example, and it was freaking me out, you know, I think in the middle of a flare, there's so much terror and anger and um, the thoughts going through your head is it's never going to stop and I can't, I can't handle it and I can't survive it. And you start to almost hyperventilate and, to meditate, it's just to, it's kind of to let those thoughts quiet down and get a, get a little silence between them. And again, it's not like anyone who meditates never has any thoughts go through their mind, but you stop attaching to them. You stop repeating them to yourself. You start, you stop escalating them. Instead, it's just thought comes through, you note it, you let it go. And then eventually the thoughts kind of slowly calm down on their own. It's like, um, if it's a drag race of thinking, it slows down to just a gentle stroll of thinking and it feels very different. And I'll, I would feel my heart rate kind of slow down and my, the panic like in my digestion would, would kind of smooth out. And, and that was really wonderful and really necessary. So, and, and I still feel that now I I'm no longer having flares like that. So it's not as acute an experience, but I might be, might be stressed out with a deadline, um, even though I work for myself, I, I set deadlines and I meet them. I'm one of those people. So even if I set my own deadline, I still feel beholden to them. And if I'm feeling nervous about how much work I have on my plate, if I meditate, it can, again, take away those feelings of tension. If I am 
I mean, I'm still a human being, so I still have emotions um, about life in general, or it might be about, again, the rheumatoid arthritis, because I think it is a continual challenge to be graceful with chronic illness, even if you're doing very well managing it, <clears throat> you still have ups and downs. And meditation will help me on a day that's tough. Like maybe I'll wake up feeling kind of mentally groggy and not as energetic as I should. And maybe my joints are a little stiffer than I would like. And maybe my mind starts going to a dark place because of that. And if I meditate, it won't necessarily change how I'm physically feeling, but it will change my attitude about how I'm feeling. Sure. And, and meditation for me, you know, it, it's a lot of different things. Sometimes it's guided. That's always nice because it fills your mind for you. Um, sometimes it's just listening to relaxing music and deep breathing. Sometimes it's classic silent meditation. Sometimes it's just being mindful. Like I tried to meditate the other night and my mind would not stop. It was just racing. And so instead, I just started paying attention to the room I was in because it shifts your thought process. So I would just be like, okay, so how does the light fall from the lamp? What's that shadow? My blanket on my bed has an interesting S curve right now where it's folded over and it's interesting when you just ground yourself in the present. It doesn't have to be glamorous. I wasn't out in a park someplace beautiful. I was in my bedroom, you know, um, but I was able to, all I did was just look around the room and notice everything I could and it calmed me down the same way meditation does. For sure. And I'm, I can't meditate. I've tried, <laughs> I've tried so many times. So what I did at, at, at my worst and what I still do now um, because I think nothing makes you more aware of being sort of trapped than when you're in a body that's in a flare mm -hmm. and there's nowhere to go. Like you can't actually get out of your body and leave it behind for a while just to get a bit of relief. You've got to find a nice little oasis in your mind somewhere so that things can quiet down. And so I, um, unbeknownst to me, before I got sick, I had very cleverly made a fantastic hypnosis uh, recording that um, I'd made for other people that actually turned out to be perfect for me. And I listened to that maybe two or three times a day because it got me to that really deep state of relaxation because I was in constant anxiety, you know, which is partly by the disease, but also a lot of it was caused by the, the disease because, you know, what I mean, depression, anxiety isn't like normal anxiety. It's, it's physiologically generated by, you know, the, the flare and the inflammation that's going on in the brain and the body. So it's not normal, just calm yourself down anxiety. It's, it's within you. So anything, you know, that, that will work, whether it's meditation, um, hypnotherapy, anything you can do, I think that's the best advice I'd give to anybody. Find something that will actually allow you to physically relax and yeah, that I will have break the circuit. And I love that you brought up hypnosis because that's wonderful for people who feel they can't meditate. It gets you to that state with help, right? It's like mm -hmm. a meditation assistant almost. Mm -hmm. And then one thing that made me think of when you were saying anything that can calm you down, um, I have some friends who are such pet lovers, right? And just petting their cat or dog or whatever that may be, can it, that can be meditative for people mm -hmm. and so incredibly soothing. So there's mm -hmm. so many ways so many ways we can take a deep breath and you're right. It's, it's essential. I really don't think you can, you I mean, you can, I mean, you absolutely can live your autoimmune life, not doing that, but it won't feel as very good. No, mm -mm. no for sure. And a large part of, of the mindset, and we sort of touched on this before about having a chronic, chronic illness is acceptance. And look, it sounds like you're in a pretty good place with where you are. What would be your advice to other people on how to find a way to accept the illness and, and still, you know, go on and, and look after themselves and love themselves and look after themselves? You know, I would say be gentle with yourself and I would say it's a journey. I mean, it takes time to get there. I think setting the goal is a good thing if that's something that you intend to do and you want to do. and for me, so differently, I, I write in a journal that really helps me figure stuff out sometimes. And so if you're, you're a writer personality, that can be helpful. Um, EFT, emotional freedom technique, is all about acceptance. I mean, it's right in there. I completely love and accept myself, which most people will feel resistance as soon as they say that out loud. Mm -hmm. So I think practicing EFT is like, a, it's like exercising the acceptance muscle. 
So I think that's helpful. Um, but just take it take it one step at a time. It's because I'm what I'm four plus years in. I don't think I started accepting it till even two years in because I was looking for a cure before then. And then the past two years, I've been I have been setting a goal to accept, and I feel like I've only gotten really close to accepting recently. And then I'm old enough to know that I'm probably not 100% there. So it's probably, you know, it's probably a lifetime journey to continue to get to deeper and deeper levels with it. I feel like I'm much, much more peaceful than I was. Well, I know I am. So if people are just starting out, just be gentle with yourself because I could, I don't know about you, Carrie, but my first year, if I did an interview like this, I would have been crying a lot through the interview. Mm -hmm. And it was just so raw. So I think that's part of the process too. Oh, for sure. I, I cried in front of people who have never seen me cry before. I mean, it, is, it just, becoming chronically ill um, is a traumatic process. You've got to go through the grief response, which was a whole lot of things. It's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. And um, acceptance is a day-to-day, sometimes minute-to-minute thing that you're just constantly, constantly, constantly um, practicing and you're not going to get it right. You know, I'll still have days. um, The issue that I most I struggle with is um, motivation and lack of focus. Mm. Um, I just don't feel, there's many days I don't feel like doing anything. I don't want to do anything. I just want to sit on the couch because there's just there's no drive or spark in me. And so it's sometimes that gritting of the teeth, just get up and cook a meal or just do something. But some days I can't even do that. And it's about getting to that stage of saying, okay, this is where I am. The more I'm going to fight against this, the more guilt I'm going to feel, the more frustration I'm going to feel, the more depression, anxiety I'm going to feel. This is how I am right now. And that's mm-hmm. okay. So it's really about that not not judging yourself, not pushing yourself, not just just being okay with where you are and, and practicing self compassion. I couldn't agree more. And I know for me with EFT, I I really struggled with that statement as well. And what helped me, and it sounds like what you're talking about too, is I added in this moment to it. Mm-hmm. So I would say I completely love and accept myself in this moment. And I feel like if we're only living moment by moment, I felt like, well, that was enough. So that Mm. lets me, I think what it did is it allowed me to accept a bad day without projecting it into the future and feeling Mm. like I would always have a bad day. Mm. Um, And it is interesting because like you said, it changes. So acceptance is accepting all of the different ways we're going to feel. And sometimes I have, sometimes I feel awesome and I'll meditate and it's just joy. And then other times I'm surprised. um, I will have thought I felt fine. Like I might be having, I'm having a good day today. For example, I've been really happy today, really productive, really energized, peaceful, no stress. I might go meditate tonight and cry. And that happens sometimes. And I'll be like, okay, so there was grief underneath somewhere that I wasn't feeling and it'll take me by surprise. But instead of, so part of the acceptance for me is to not judge that. It's not like I, I think part of me in the past would have been like, what's wrong with you? You've had a good day. Why are you sad? Um, but instead, it's just like, well, that's, in- I just say, that's interesting. Hmm. So there's grief there. Hmm. And I accept that as part of the experience today. It doesn't mean I wasn't happy earlier. It just means it's not that simple. Exactly. And you mentioned before, Eileen, that you're really good with setting boundaries and you've had mm-hmm. to let some relationships go. And I know that is a big one for a lot of people with chronic disease because the things that you were putting up with before from people or jobs or situations, it's just not good for you to continue to put up with that. So any advice on how to like get rid of those toxic people or how to set those boundaries? And I think that's a lesson in self-love too. I think you need to feel like you are worth better than that. So you need to, yeah, so, so you need to, Oh, it's hard. <laughs> it require it does. It requires self love, self confidence. It it facing the unknown, right? Because when you, even if you have a relationship that is toxic, say, if it's one you've had for a long time, it's familiar. You might even have some security in it in some capacity. 
Um, letting it go might mean being alone for a while in some area in your life. Um, definitely stepping out into the unknown. And so it's, a, it's a, an act of faith and self-love every time you, you say, I'm not going to allow that negativity to be part of my daily life. And and I would again say be gentle with yourself and do it as you can. I mean, it's not like someone can wake up one day and just say, okay, I'm just going to be a different person because I know not everyone's like me. I, 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 I've been working on boundaries probably my whole life, and that's because probably like you, Carrie, I'm very empathic. So um, as a young person, I could feel what people were feeling, um, and it would exhaust me. And so I learned how to not feel what they were feeling. I can now, I can still very easily identify what people are feeling who are in my presence, but I don't feel it inside my body anymore. So that was a boundary I learned early on. And I think along those ways. So like one of my life lessons is I, I have a bit of a savior complex. So um, again, when I was younger, I would, I had relationships where I was trying to fix people. I tried to save different members of my family from themselves. I tried to save boyfriends from themselves and friends from themselves. And I did it a lot of times. And each time I would catch myself in a new situation where I was doing that, I'd be like, haven't you learned this lesson yet? So certainly not perfect, but long before getting rheumatoid arthritis, I'd been working on this issue. So I would say be, by the time I got RA, I'm trying to, I don't think I had very many people in my life I needed to let go. You know, I had that client that I talked about, a couple of clients that I had to let go. But I think I had already ended most of the toxic relationships in my life. And some of them took me years to end. And others, it wasn't about ending them because they're my family, but it's about deciding how much energy I'm going to give them. And, and you get to set your own rules for this in terms of, how you want to do it and how you want that person to be in your life or not and how you want to prepare for it and who you want to support you as you try and do this and who you want to pick if you have a bunch of people in your life that are like this you know start with who's the easiest is there someone you can practice with like some acquaintance or coworker who just makes you feel awful all the time you don't even like them but you're nice to them and you spend time with them well stop spending time with them because you don't even care about them. You know, that would be one place. You don't have to start with who you're living with, for example. No, absolutely right. And what's the key bit of advice that you would give the partner and family of someone who's just been newly diagnosed with an autoimmune disease? You know, I have so much compassion for them too, because isn't it like they, it, it, I mean, it's like the family unit gets sick when someone gets sick because it's not it, it's not an isolated experience and it's going to change everything. It changes the dynamic completely. Um, and and what I would say, it, two things. So for the people who love someone who's chronically ill, you need to have some support because you're probably going to be providing a lot of support. And if you are a self-sacrificing person, you're going to wear out very quickly. And, and so I do believe that the people who love us need to have some joy in their lives and, it, and their life can't be totally about what's going on with us. Um, and so that's the scenario of having someone in your life who's a natural caregiver. If you have someone in your life who is not a natural caregiver, they ironically have to go the other direction. So then the advice for that type of person, like say for example, who knows? So say it's a husband who's used to the wife taking care of him what I would say to him, it, it's your turn, you yeah. know, it's, that's the in sickness and in health and that's the, the, the time and you, you can do that. I think we all have the capability to give and receive care, but we tend to have something that's more natural for us and we tend to attract people who are the opposite. And so this, that's probably not uncommon to have the tables turn. Um, and I would imagine that's difficult for both parties when that happens. And, Again, so each person to be gentle with themselves and communicate through the process. If you're confused or you're angry or you're upset or um, you don't know what to do or, you know, talk it through. And then I wouldn't, I mean, marriage counseling is not a bad idea when something like this is going on. Um, or family counseling if there are, you know, children in the house because mm. it, it affects everyone. And my heart goes out to the kids especially because kids often 
will be the caregivers. Like there's something about children that usually, even though we are supposed to be taking care of them, I don't know what it is about kids. They're very tender hearted. And um, in a lot of situations where a parent is chronically ill, it's like the child becomes the parent and no guilt for the person who's chronically ill. So I'm not judging that. I'm just, I think it's helpful to be aware that that can happen. Mm-hmm. And so to be able to let the good parts of that happen where the child can be tender and loving, but without them feeling responsible for you. I think that's really important so they can keep on being a kid. Yeah. And not be overwhelmed with the fear for the parent. Mm -hmm. Mm, That's a big Mm -hmm. thing. And I found ironically, it's, it's not so much the beginning of the, the disease because normally that's when everybody rallies and everybody comes around, everybody is concerned. It's the ongoing Mm -hmm. process of the years that go after that when it's like, you know, I know with myself, I still have to remind my kids, I can't do what I did before. You know, I I need you to step up and keep doing your chores around the house and, you know, help me clean up before I've got a client coming over or help me with dinner tonight because, you know, most of the time I can do stuff but other times I can't and it's going to exhaust me to do that. So it it's that ongoing communication, isn't it? It's really having that ongoing open communication and also having those boundaries. And I think the biggest issue that a lot of people make when they're trying to set boundaries is they think they only need to do it once. Right. No, I've learned no. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the broken record technique. It's just keep bringing it up, keep bringing it up, keep bringing it up mm-hmm. and, and be persistent. I agree completely. And just last thing before we finish up, it's been so good talking to you. I could keep oh, going. Same here. <laughs> what is the one thing that you've done that's made the biggest difference to how you feel and live now? Um, well, I mean, it's a boring answer, but really the diet made the biggest difference for me because it was it's um, I, I have a very physical response to certain foods so um and i learned that through the elimination and reintroduction process and and my body is one of those like hypersensitive bodies so if i have a dusting of nightshade spices i'm going to feel like i'm 90 years old within 24 hours and it might be two weeks before I feel pretty good again and two months before I felt like I did before that exposure. So it's really dramatic for me. So removing the problematic foods has been huge. Um, But I'm also like, I I look at things holistically. So I did also address my sleep patterns. I used to be a night owl, which means mostly for night owls, it means you, you get very erratic levels of sleep. You stay up really late, and then if it's a work day, you have to get up early, and then you try and catch up on the weekend. Or And then if you sleep in on the weekend, the later you sleep in, the later you stay up, and it gets all very weird, and it's very bad for your circadian rhythms. And, um, and so I did change. I gave myself a bedtime and a wake time within an hour's grace on each side, but that's very different than I think it used to fluctuate five to six hours on each side. So, um, And I felt after... 30 days of that change, I felt an, an inflammation shift in my body. So that did make a difference for me. Um, and then just really the emotion piece is, is huge. I think the, the realizing we're more than just physical bodies and really addressing self-love, self-care, support, letting yourself feel what you feel. If you're really struggling, you know, doing what's necessary to, to either just know you're going to struggle for a while or get help. I mean, is, is the other thing. So, and, and then I'm not done. I mean, it's, it's kind of a constant, I sometimes think of it like in a kayak where you're kind of rocking on the water and hopefully you don't capsize. Right. But you have to just kind of, you realize as you, as as the waves come, sometimes there's bigger waves, sometimes there's smaller waves and you need to adjust accordingly. And it's, it's the autoimmune journey. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So how can people find out? where you are and where they can connect with you, Eileen. Sure. So my website is phoenixhelix.com and people often want to know where I came up with that name. So the Phoenix probably will make sense to all of you. But when I was at my worst, I literally felt like I was on fire with the pain and and, and RA pain often feels very hot and I desperately wanted to rise above. So the Phoenix was a symbol of hope for me and 
I think it's a beautiful symbol of hope for most people. So that's why I chose that. And the helix represents our DNA and our ability to turn our genes on and off, not to that simple cure level that I had hoped for originally, but certainly in, I think, how, how intensely our disease manifests on a daily basis. So Phoenix Helix was all about rising above and being empowered to, like you said, live the best autoimmune life possible. Mm -hmm. So phoenixhelix.com, I have um, a podcast, which is also Phoenix Helix. I have show notes on my blog, and I can you can find ways to listen there. But if you're in iTunes, you can just look me up, and you can find me there. And then I also host the AIP Recipe Roundtable once a week on my blog, where you can find new recipes so you're not in ruts in the kitchen. And then I publish articles on different things. Like I think most recently I talked, I answered some questions such as, can you do the AIP as a vegetarian? Um, does food intolerance testing work? Um, things like that. So please come over and say hello. Fantastic. And I encourage everybody who's watching to do that because Eileen was one of the first people that I found um, and I found her own story was inspiring. Not only that, but the range of things you have on your website, Eileen, is just fantastic from the scientific research stuff to the practical cooking to the emotional side. You know, it's a really lovely blend of all the, all the things that people need to know to have hope and be inspired. So thank you so much for talking thank to you. me today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. It's been a pleasure for me too. And thank you for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Okay. Thanks and hope to speak to you again soon. Yes. Bye.